Welcome to RoboHub. Today we'll be traveling to Chatsworth, California. It's a city in the LA region and we're going to talk to Ed Murr, the founder and CEO of Machina Labs. Ed's got a really interesting background. So he's worked at SpaceX, he's worked at Relativity Space, and so he's very familiar with the space industry and the manufacturing processes in the space industry. And he's used that to start this new company called Machina Labs, where they're essentially using robots to act as automated blacksmiths. And they can form sheet metal parts. And they're really, really efficient at doing that, especially at low volumes. Um, but they can also make some interesting sh shapes and geometries that previously were not possible. So this is a response to the traditional sheet metal industry, where you make a mold, you wait for months um, for these really, really large parts, and you, sp you spend a lot of money up front to make those molds, and then you have to continually iterate on the actual mold before you can get something useful out of it. So tune in. Any, like, what are some cool manufacturing companies like in your... You know, I think, obviously I'm biased. <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot of folks who are working on 3D printing. I think it's a cool idea. I, you know, I, I used to work on 3D printing, right? Yeah. Before this company, I was in relativity space, uh, building a 3D printer. Um, so I think 3D printing is pretty cool. I think it's just, you know, the applications are not as varied as people initially thought. Yeah. I mean, like, interest, they're like, very, very good, for example, for a heat exchanger or a rocket engine. Mm. I think all rocket engines will be built with 3D printing eventually. Like, there's going to be no, it just doesn't make sense to make it any other way, right? Yeah. But, um, but like, you know, tanks, you know, uh, you know, rolling the sheet metal is much easier. Yeah. Um, and much more efficient, right? So I think I, I'm excited for folks who are working on processes. There's a lot of cool companies on 3D printing. I think I'm excited for folks who are doing, doing things that are not 3D printing. Um, there's a company that does, I, I live with a company called Fabrisonic. It is 3D printing, but they're doing these ultrasonic sheets they say they do very like foil basically foils that mm. that you ultrasonically weld together to build yeah so there's no heat basically it's just like you know basically ultrasonic you put a really thin yeah uh, sheet of metal foil of metal and then weld it and they kind of build stack that way and so the idea there is that you can make it like uh, um like really like high strength you can make it um so the throughput is not much but you can do very thin parts so one mm -hmm. of the challenges with sheet metal uh, with um, 3D printers is that you know you're melting and then you, you solidify yeah. and then there's a lot of stresses in the part because you go through that melting solidification then the heat creates a lot of stresses that get trapped into the part mm -hmm. that deforms the part so like you cannot have a thin sheet of metal 3D printed it, it, the moment it's done it's just like worse mm -hmm. um, so this is the low heat processes allows you to kind of like get rid of that warpage yeah um, which makes you gives you like these like very thin unsupported parts to be very accurate. Yeah. Um, so that's what's exciting about them. Um, there are companies who are trying to do like fast three D printing again. It's just a lot of focus on three D printing, and I'm excited for all of them. But uh, you know, not a whole lot of folks like you know us who are doing exactly outside of three D printing parts. Yeah. that cannot be three D printing. Yeah, previously you were at Relativity. Yeah. Right, and then like, so what was the like 3D printing process like over there? So and, like the innovation that they did? So that's an interesting one. So I, at Relativity, I was in charge of the team that was building the 3D printer that we had. So I think this is still, so the core tenant of Relativity was, can we 3D print a rocket, right? Mm -hmm. right? And the benefit is that you can easily change your design, right? I don't know how much you know about um, some of the challenges SpaceX had, but Falcon 9, Mm -hmm. could never get fatter it could only get taller and it actually got really bad because it kept getting taller and control of it became, became tough why couldn't it get fatter? because the moment you have fat you have to make new molds for the tanks mm. you have to redo your shop floor basically so it's like a go, cost break it's just cost break you have to build another factory yeah um, and uh, so it's like everybody's just like yeah, so let's go fatter and go taller at some point then people were like just like shoving things in wherever space they could find without <laughs> making it taller right um so it gives you a lot of like the moment you can you can kind of like this change the design but you know ad hoc it gives you a lot of flexibility right it gives you a lot of knobs to play with to, yeah. to, to fine-tune your vehicle um so the idea was like yeah if you can 3d print it you can turn like completely remove that dependency to you know hardware Product specific factories. Yeah. Um, so so that that was the goal. So an engine is a very right fit 
you know, build rocket engine 3D printed. And like I said, every rocket engine will be 3D printed. Um, but then what, what do you do with the rest of the stuff? What do you do with the structure of the rocket? So uh, what we were doing in there was like building a printer that could print the structures of the rocket. But the main challenge is how can you get, well, feasible? Like, you know, if you use a powder bed printer, you cannot build a 22 feet tall or yeah. even taller like a structure. That's a very giant machine, lots of powder. So the idea was how can you create a high throughput printing process? They can create these larger structural machines. So we landed on a uh, wire DED process, where it seems like you're, you're basically welding layer by layer into mm. these tanks. But there's a whole bunch of challenges there. Like this tank that's a thin wall, you're melting it, solidifying it. It, it you know, it causes distresses cause the tank to buckle. Yeah. So you have to start thinking about all these challenges. Like how can you resolve these issues with this process of basically it's just continuous weld continuous yeah. weld like you know we had tanks that would like one week of just the welder running yeah like it's a robot the welder attached to a robot and then kind of welding so it comes down to pro 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 problem of what are the right process parameters so they can actually get a right part in the end yeah so that was the main challenge so lots of like empirical modeling of the process and building models so it's like, is that like an expensive process of like try and like fail and try and fail and try and fail or like heavy simulations? So yeah, so that's that's where the challenge comes into play is that simulations take a long time. Yeah. Um, so it's easier to just build a part and look at the results as opposed to simulate it. Yeah. Um, but, but if you also just keep building parts and you can the result, you're kind of heuristically improving the process. That is also not a good way. Uh, at least it doesn't easily scale. If you have like good smart engineers, you can do it, but but it doesn't easily scale. So the key is, can you capture enough data to build empirical models from the process? And then instead of simulating, build the same thing the simulation would give you, but through empirical mm -hmm. process. So that's what, what we mostly try to do at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we do here too as well, so to some extent. And so is that, that was the last place you worked before uh, um, uh, starting this company? Yes, so I mean, I did the small gigs here and there. I was an advisor for a couple, uh, Bird, the scooters, yeah. for a while. Um, um, but, but yes, but uh, this is the, the goal was after that, I was, I was working on the idea for Machina. And the, really the concept was 3D printing is great, but doesn't cover all kinds of parts. How can we make a platform that uses the right tool for the right process? Yeah but it still delivers the same type of agility the 3D printing brings, mm -hmm. but for all kinds of things, <clears throat> right? Which was like kind of resulted in this idea of robotic craftsmen, right? yeah. because craftsmen are super flexible. If you can robotize that, then maybe that's the interesting thesis for a unit of manufacturing for future factories. Yeah, because then that way you can just make it repeatable. Like you, can repeat yes, it you can scale, scale it, it and you can, yes, you replicate it, scale it. You can have a facility that has 300 of these robotic, robotic craftsman cells yeah. that can each that can be programmed to do different operations. You know, we talked about this a little bit about data centers. Data centers are basically replaced supercomputers with the same kind of thinking. You had these supercomputers initially back in the 80s and 90s where like it's one very expensive computer yeah. that can do one type of a calculation really fast. That is very similar to how factories operate today. It's one factory that can build one product, but yeah. it's very optimized to build that one product. The moment you want to change your product, and the same thing with supercomputer, you want to change the calculation, then you have to build another supercomputer or another factory in this yeah. case. So the idea is, can you then create this flexible unit that horizontally can scale, similar to how a data center has a small computer. Each computer is not that powerful. Mm -hmm. But it can be programmed to do different operations, but then you can have a data center that has 3,000 of these things, and then now collectively they're as powerful as a supercomputer, uh, but then they can be programmed to do different things. Can we do that for manufacturing? And what that unit looks like? Would it be this robotic, and our thesis is there's this robotic cell that you can program it to do different operations. It can do 3D printing if you wanted to do, mm -hmm. it can do sheet forming if you wanted to do, but you program it just through software to do different operations. And now you have this facility of 300, 400 of these, that you can create all kinds of parts by defining each cell to do different things. Yeah. And now you're a very flexible factory that can be defined through software to do different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so just like some of the other differences, you're doing uh, sheet metal uh, forming, right? Right. So the, the, the big advantage that you guys are bringing is that you don't have to like create this mold and like this several month long process of trying to get um, like a new part up and running. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's 
the problem of rigid factories is very evident issue though. Yeah. Uh, you have to make these molds. They're like size of a room sometimes. Right? Yeah. Like for example, you're talking about a side panel of a car, it's a very giant mold. And these molds, yeah, like you said, takes months to build. And you have to also do a bunch of iterations on it because the part you make, the part that, that you end up getting is not really the shape of the mold. Mm. Because sheet metal has this problem that it springs back. So you, mm. and you've probably seen it. You def, when you bend something and yeah. you release it, it kind of bends back a little bit. So you have yeah. to actually bend it more to the way you release it. It goes to the to the angle that you want yeah. it. Same thing as a sheet metal. So the actual mold that you're making is very different than the geometry. It stamps it, but once the, geometry, the sheet comes off the, the mold, then it springs into shape. So is this like an exact science or is this like, uh, I mean, you make it sound like you have to actually still adjust it even like for yeah. these people who have experience and this is their bread and butter. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of interesting. You still have to do, some, depends on the geometry. Mm -hmm. um, there are simulation software that give you a little bit what that looks like. <clears throat> so there's like FEA simulation software that tells you, okay, the, if the mold looks like this, this is this is the part you're going to get. Um, it works for a lot of um, kind of like streamlined parts, mm -hmm. uh, but you still, there's an art called die fitting, which is still a very, very much of an art. Mm -hmm. You make a die and you modify the die afterwards. And these are like really skilled labor folks that like go in, grind the die down in certain portions, actually weld to it and then grind it down again to modify the shape of the die. And the quote process is called die fitting. And sometimes you have to do multiple dies. You'd be like, okay, I got this. All right, these are the, this is the best I could get. Let's calculate how off the part is and now we need to make another die. Yeah. So sometimes you go some of those, you do have to do some iterations on the die itself. Yeah. But simulations help to get you very close. Yeah, yeah. So. What was the what was the motivation behind uh, Machina Labs? Yeah, um, really, I think working on three D printing. What you realize is that it's very powerful, right? If you wanna, if you're an engineer coming out of school, and you're a mechanical engineer as well, um, and you want to build a very impactful part, yeah. you have to go work for a very large corporation who can afford to build a factory that can make that part. Mm -hmm. Um, so 3D printing was in a sense very powerful for folks who have like great ideas because they could easily get their hands on a part. The challenge, and that's why I worked in 3D printing, mm -hmm. um, but the challenge with 3D printing is that it doesn't, cannot do all kinds of parts. Mm -hmm. So the motivation behind Machina Labs was what is, it, what is the technical platform that we can build that's just not limited to the type of parts that 3D printing can do, but mm -hmm. it brings the benefit of 3D printing to all kinds of parts. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of just the thesis and the genesis of Machina Labs. Yeah. Now, so we started from there, but then we have to decide where to start, and then we landed on sheet metal to begin with. But the, the road is long. Like, you know, we want to do other processes after sheet metal. Yeah. Everything our platform allows us to do those processes. Yeah. There, there was this kind of this idea, um, you know, when, when 3D printing was booming that, like, you can just do anything with 3D printing, and eventually everything will be done by 3D printing. But, I mean, what, what we ended up realizing is that there are some things that are just better like not 3D printed. Yeah, I always say, you know, and I'm guilty of this in a lot of previous jobs trying to fit 3D printing into uh, a part that is not a good fit for it. Yeah. Um, but I think it came from a good place. It was like, okay, the other process is so painful, you yeah. know, I'm still willing to try 3D printing, even though it's not the best fit for this process, right? But, but I agree with you, I think maybe there is a better way. Mm. Because there are better way to bring the same agility that 3D printing brings, but it's the more efficient and more straightforward way of making those parts. Yeah. And I think sheet metal parts are an example of that. Like, you know, unsupported sheet metal is like not a good fit for, for 3D printing. Yeah. But is there another way? I think, yeah. We, th we think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, so one of the, like, the nightmares of being a mechanical engineer or yeah. like working with these type of products is that when you're in that low volume world, it's just painful to get anything done. You have to like, you know, beg, borrow, steal for funds to be able to afford anything. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's where three D printing got really interesting. Um, but yeah, now you, yeah, you're talking about metal parts and you're talking about uh, strength in different axes and all of that. Like that, that changes a little bit. Yeah. yeah. How, how does the process work in that kind of lab? Yeah. So, so at core we have these robotic cells yeah. that very much work like a like a craftsman, like a blacksmith. They can pick up different tools then apply it to material, um, uh, and then create all kinds of geometries out of different materials. So mm -hmm. 
Um, so the, if you go through our cells, you see there's, there's these robots that can manipulate material in seven axes, so with lots of degrees of freedom. There are actually two robots that they can collaboratively work together. But each of them also have a tool tray where they can mm -hmm. go drop one tool and pick up another. Um, so the tool is the end effector that it uses. Yes. Yeah. yes. So it's uh, whatever the robot picks up goes at the end of the robot, then you can apply it to the material. Mm. So it, uh, automatic switching for those You tools. can do automatic switching, exactly. That's cool. um, but the core process we started to apply this platform to first was sheet forming. And, and the way it really works is very similar to how a potter kind of forms a clay bowl. Yeah. You see these two robots coming. There's a flat sheet in between them. There's two robots on two sides. They come in from two sides. And basically, they pinch and deform the sheet between those two robots. They both have these stylus-looking end effectors. Yeah. They come in and pinch and deform the sheet and slowly form it into a shape that you want. The same way a potter, like you know, you know, pinches a clay bowl and then yeah. it's rotating on the you know rotating table to give it a shape. That's exactly basically what they're doing uh, to the sheet of metal. Except that that's a clay, and this is potentially might be a sheet of titanium. That's you have to apply a weight of a truck to deform it. Yeah. So like, if, if you're talking about a shape like this, so this has the, uh, an end effector on each side that's that's pushing it into this. Specific geometry. Yes, it's a defector on both sides coming and push, pinch, bend, stretch. There's actually a bunch of phenomenons happening at the tip. But yeah, but basically with the help of two tips, you're deforming the product slowly into shape. Has anyone done that before? There has been, academia has been thinking about this, maybe I would say similar concepts over the past 20, 30 years, right? Actually, some of them. Um, uh, for example, in Northwestern, that you know, Professor uh, Jian Chao, who is advisor to our company as well, has been probably one of the older, one of the most prolific researchers in this area. Yeah. Um, it's a field of called incremental forming, um, but no commercial solutions as of today. Um, there has been some R and D done by some of the automotive companies, um, but we think the way we are approaching it is kind of finally enabled to commercialize it. Uh, so lots of lots of academic work, but not so not a lot of commercial commercialized activity there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I mean, you you've got a couple of parts here. Like how, what are some of the differences between them? Like I see this one has like quite a bit of like a smooth finish to it as well. Yeah, that's a very tough part actually. So this is a titanium part. Um, titanium traditionally is very hard to form in room temperature. It actually cracks usually. Mm. So like Ti six four. Um, obviously very common alloy in aerospace because it has a very good weight to strength ratio. So it's super light and super strong. Um, so it's a very good fit, for example, applications that are either you need like, you know, hypersonic planes, um, uh, it's, it's commonly used, but you can't really form it. So traditional people, the only process they use either, um, they mostly machine it. Yeah. And if you want to uh, 3D print it, you need a special printer that is very, um, uh, can because it's also very easily um, uh, corrodes. Yeah. Uh, so like you need to have a very environmentally controlled three D printer if you want to print it. So we are able to basically form this material. So that's one. In addition to kind of provide more flexibility to forming, um, our process can also form some of the materials that traditionally were not possible. And this is one of them. Yeah. But we also form other parts from like aluminum. These are aluminum parts to uh, we have steel parts in the corner, uh, stainless steel. Um, so, you know, you look at the, the, the physical model of this, like yeah. how true to the, the model that's designed by the customer is this final shape? Well, that one, that one is a test piece, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I don't know if there was even a design behind it. Mm. Um, but like you look at these parts, let's say look at this part. This is plus minus one millimeter of the customer part. Mm -hmm. um, and the main challenge is when you're forming a part, when you're forming a part, like I said, with sheet metal, sheet metal has a lot of spring back in it. You form yeah. it, and when you're done and you cut the material, it actually moves a little bit. Um, so those are the things we kind of account for in our software stack. What is the actual part you have to form that once you cut it and trimmed it out, it springs into the yeah. right geometry? Um, but yeah, like for example, our goal is to get to a point, I mean, the best tolerance is you get in sheet metal board wall, because sheet metal is also flimsy. Yeah. It's hard to get very high tolerances in it. Um, the best tolerance is like in automotive board, we're looking at, you know, half a millimeter. Yeah. And that's plus minus one. Let's see. I mean, this, this doesn't really bend, but certainly a lot of sheet metal parts, they have a little bit of give anyway. Yeah. 
And I think this, I mean, like, and, and you think about, I'm talking about, like, you know, yeah, it doesn't bend, but actually, in reality, probably I just moved it half a million. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So we're talking about, like, very tight tolerances, right? So, like, if this is plus minus one, like, you can probably, I could probably move this yeah. out before. Yeah, like, you can see it flexes five, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, but uh, sheet metal in general is, like, a, a little bit tough compared to machine, machine parts to get it very accurate in yeah. terms of tolerances. So, like, how much of the team here is like software developers who are who are doing all the magic behind, like, doing the the, the special routing of the end effector to make this possible? Yeah, software software is our biggest property engineering team. Software and robotics, yeah. right? Um, but we also have other disciplines like mechanical engineering, who puts the cells together, the end effect design of the end effectors, design of the fixtures that hold the sheet. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, but robotic and software is a big portion of the team. We also have the team of folks who develop the process parameters, right? Behind, okay, if you want to form titanium, what changes do we need to make to our cell to make sure we yeah. form titanium? Um, but yeah, I think 60 to 70% of the team is still software and robotics. Yeah. Um, yeah, from like software that modifies the CAD until it's formable to the software that controls the robots to actually do the things that we asked them to do. Yeah. So similar to relativity, is, is this one of the ones where, you know, it's a very complex um, interaction that you're having. So it's going to take a lot of like experimenting, um, adjusting parameters, like, you know, you, you have the whole engineers dedicated to that. Right. Is this also something where over here you're going to have to do a lot of empirical testing? Yeah. Um, I think that's a key approach basically we have taken compared to academia. You said like, you know, who has worked on this? So academia traditionally tries to simulate. Um, also, just one reason they try to simulate is they don't have access to hardware. Yeah. Um, so the one fundamental approach that we took is that how can we create a system that we can instrument and gather a whole bunch of data from every second of forming? So every second that we're forming these things, we know exactly what are the forces, mm -hmm. how is the robot deflecting. Uh, we can get the scan of the part anytime you want. So just like how is actually deformation looks like. So the same robot that forms it can pick up a scanner and scan it at any point. Yeah. So the idea is, can you be good, we create a platform that easily captures data so that we can build empirical models so that we can predict what, what is happening yeah. when you're doing the forming process, as opposed to simulating and using physics. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's one of the main approaches that we think is kind of fundamentally going to change how we can commercialize this technology. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, where are you guys at with your customer base and what type of customers are you guys working with? Yeah, I think... It's interesting. I don't know if it's a result of our network. Uh, founding here, we come from aerospace. So most yeah. of our customers early on were aerospace and defense. I think still probably like 80% of our revenue comes from um, air, aerospace defense. Next year, we're actually going more into automotive, heavy machinery, marine. Mm -hmm. The nice thing with sheet metal is that it's the most, the biggest metal processing sector out of all prop metals. That's oh, really? It's a $250 billion industry, where it says, for example, additive is 16 compared to that. And like CNC machine? CNC is 112. So it's like almost twice the, twice the CNC. CNC. And it makes sense. You know, you, you drive in the freeway, you're basically driving in a sea of sheet metal. Yeah. Right? You're sitting in an airplane, you're in basically a sheet metal can. Yeah. Um, so it's a very common, um, it's the most common metal form. Um, the feedstock is very cheap. Um, but that means that a lot of industries can potentially be a good customer. But I think we started with aerospace. We still have dominant presence in aerospace and defense, partially because we came from there. But also aerospace defense is more um, uh, 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 more uh, open to try new, new techniques because they have those challenges. They mm -hmm. have to form titanium that nobody else could form. Mm -hmm. You know, they, have, they also have lower volumes and the costs are pretty high. Right, if you're forming a satellite tank, they want five of it. So if making them more yeah. just doesn't make sense for them. Um, but yeah, so that's that's where we're starting. Yeah. So I mean, your sweet spot in the market is—is is it going to be something like uh, the the lower volume end, but like high uh, customization, and you know you want to be able to iterate on the design again and yeah. again and again? I think. It's interesting you brought that up because I think definitely the lower the volume is, the better we shine, right? Yeah. Because the traditional technique is make a mold. The mold is very expensive. If you have to make one part with it, that means the cost of your part is the cost of the mold. Yeah. So one part, we shine a lot. But 
Well, I personally think, I mean, if you think about, if you do fundamental thinking about this and say, okay, what does it take to make a robot? And what does it take to make a mold? Mm -hmm. What goes into making a robotic system and what goes into making a mold? They're not that different, right? Mm -hmm. And the robot yeah. sounds fancy, but like at the end of the day, they're like casted bodies, similar to a mold. Um, they have motors, which are several motors, you know, the cost of that keep going down with the electrification. Mm -hmm. I think you can like like for example, Kuka robots. They use Siemens motors. Each of them are twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars if you you know buy them from Siemens directly. And there's machine gearboxes in it, which is just machine gearbox. So at the end of the day, like robot is not significantly physical sense different than a mold. It just mm -hmm. it's a more intelligent configuration of material than that you get in a mold. Mold can make one part. This robot can make many parts. Yeah. So I think. In long, but the robots are expensive because demand for them is not that high. Yeah. Right. So in long term, I think, which I think about break even point of what is the mold can make, what does the robot can make? That number in theory is actually very high. So I mean, I guess the other part of this is that uh, to make the mold, these companies are using like what is essentially a robot, right? Yes. It's like these like different CNC machines that are actually cutting it out of a, a block of metal. Right. 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 Yeah. Not only they use the robots. And uh, to do to make that, but also like you know, when you think about what is the break-even point, you have to think about it in terms of cost. So, the cost of the robotic system versus the cost of the mold. Yeah. In our case, they're very close. So like you could that means like sometimes up to, you know, uh, thousands of parts, which are still more cost-effective than mold. And I think as the price of robots go down, that number yeah. keeps going up. Yeah, so I guess that's an interesting thing because uh, we don't think of the price of the machinery to make a mold in the uh, in the logic for how much it's going to cost right. to make the part. We just think about okay, is the part of the the mold, and then after a few years, the machine cost is uh, is the it's worn by the manufacturer, and then it goes away. Right, right? right. and then essentially the same thing here should happen because the robots that yes, there's some maintenance that needs to be done, right. but after after a few years of manufacturing, that um, the, the hardware cost of buying the robot starts to disappear as well. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And also, the, the other thing is also, I think, you know, if you look at automotive companies, I think there's some change in thinking that's going to happen in the industry is that, like, an automotive company says, like, so I'm going to use a robot for 20,000 hours, it depreciates to zero in value, and I'm going to sell it for whatever I can get, mm. right? Versus, not a whole lot of people say, oh, well, it's motor from Siemens. You can just swap it, right? Um, mm. And I, you know, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. I think because they were using robots in a very, um, um, not, a, not necessarily in a very repetitive way, not a, like, you know, it's not core to their process. Mm. Um, so they really think about, okay, the vendor told me to use it for 20,000 hours and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it away afterwards. But like really, if you develop expertise in maintaining those systems, the life of that system can also significantly increase, if that makes sense. Yeah, interesting. And then, uh, so as far as the robots that you guys are using in your system, uh, are you guys swapping anything out with them uh, besides the end effectors? Yeah, so um, we made a conscious decision to buy off-the-shelf robots because, mm -hmm. like I said, I think they're commoditized and, you know, they're like five, six different vendors that are, you know, offering similar things. So in long term, there's a lot of um, cost reduction that I think will happen in that industry and has already happened. Um, but uh, so we, yeah, intentionally chose to use off-the-shelf robotics, but we do make modifications to them um, to make it fit our process. Yeah. For example, we need to make these robots very accurate on their very high dynamic load. Yeah. Which is not something the traditional robotic systems are thinking about in terms of their controls. That's interesting. And that can be either addition of external encoders to the robots or changing their controls so that they can actually count, count for dynamic load yeah. in accuracy. Those are the things that we do to the robots to make it fit for our process. Yeah, because nobody's using uh, robots to, or these ro robotic arms to bend titanium. <laughs> yes, yes. Most of the applications like repeat the same thing, yeah. move one thing from one location, like material handling or spot weld the same location over and over again. Yeah, right? yeah. In, in that way, it almost makes more sense to use it in this application than when you see it. You know, there's like a there's a fruit that it's lifting up, and it's this like well, two thousand pound arm. <laughs> right, right. And the funny thing is funny. You mentioned that is like you know when we were at Relativity, we had this robotic arm that was welding in one location over and over again. And we we're like, it's kind of like putting a PhD to do like, uh, 
like, you know, high school's job, right? Yeah. You know, these robots can have a lot of degrees of freedom, can apply a lot of yeah. force, but most applications just go to one location, do one thing over and over again, which is kind of literally feels like, you know, you're putting a very talented thing to do something yeah. very dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, one of the other really cool things about this is that you can unlock new geometries. Yes. Right? So, what, like, what, what are some of those new ge geometries that you can unlock? Yeah. So, at core, it comes down to the fact that when you are using a mold to form something, you need to be able to get the part off of that mold. Yeah. So the moment the wall angles of your geometry is more than 90 degrees, yeah. actually even if it's close to 90 degrees, in stamping they usually say draft angles should be, you know, you have a certain minimum draft angles. You're like, okay, yeah. you know, it cannot be less than five, six degrees. That means your wall angles are only like 86, 85 degrees. So, because you can't get a part off of the mold. So, the, the nice thing about the robots is that they can go in all the nooks and crannies and can start keep forming the part. Yeah. So, one of the main things we can do is we can form overhangs. Uh, we can form um, uh, uh, wall angles are beyond like 190 degrees. And what that allows you is to consolidate parts. So, parts that are traditionally have to yeah. be stamped separately and then connected, we can kind of make them single part. Yeah. So, like, would this be an example of it? That is not a good example of it, but this is a good example of it, right? I mean, this is, it's not easy to see in this part, but this is also, so there's 90 degrees on the yeah. side of these. Um, so stamping doesn't allow 90 degree wall angles. You need a slightly more draft mm -hmm. angle, but think of even this, if he has like a feature out here that you wanted to extrude out of this, yeah. then completely stamping cannot do. Unless you do some very complex die, which comes out in pieces. So you can open up the die and take the pieces out. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, so that's that's that, that's example of like the type of geometry we can do that the stamping cannot easily. Yeah, yeah, and also you show me this part, which like this is a really interesting uh, mechanic that this has. Yeah, no, um, uh, yeah, no. This is this is a very interesting thing, as you mentioned. So when you form a a part for some of the alloys, yeah, um, the portion that gets strained. Um, can actually change phase. Uh, basically becomes a different alloy. Yeah. So in this case, this is a 304 uh, uh, stainless steel. And if you look at the top portion of it, it's actually not magnetic. But every portion that we formed became yeah. magnetic. Um, and this has ended up, like for some of our customers, have very interesting applications where you want to locally change the property of the material, which you cannot also do in stamping, because if you stamp this thing, the whole thing gets strained, and yeah. the whole part becomes magnetic, versus so, yeah, with us, even the flat parts magnetic. are getting strained over yes. here. Yeah, which is with our case, only certain portions that we did, we kind of strained um, became magnetic. Yeah, and is there something special you have to do with, uh, with like, the type of strain that you put on there that would make it magnetic? Yes. So like in this specific case, the more strain you would get in the material, the more magnetic it would become. Um, so it comes down to like basically put more forming into it or work that portion a little bit more, even if you're not forming it more, meaning that apply more uh, stresses to that to that area. And yeah. then you get a, better, you get a um, more magnetic part. Speaking of the parts that, the type of things that we enabled that traditionally was not available to stamping, this is another one. So traditionally, so this is a composite part, okay, right? Um, and this is a composite mold. But traditionally, molds are machined. Yeah. So what what, what is a composite mold? So when you want to build a composite part, um, you need to have a mold where you lay up composite on top of it, and then you put it in a vacuum bag, you put it in an oven, and then you can cure the part, and you get your final part. So the mold is basically um, the, the initial geometry that you lay up your composite on top of. The challenge is, in the composite world, is that that mold is actually usually the bottleneck. So yeah. every time you want to change your design, you have to make another mold. Uh, and these molds are usually machined. Um, now, traditionally, sheet metal was not a good process for or good material or feedstock for mold making because you need to have a mold to form a sheet metal. Yeah. So now because our process doesn't require mold, now we actually opened up sheet metal from being a mold for composite processes. So this is a mold that we oh, formed. Very interesting. And I think tradition is going to be heavy. I'm going to try to see if I can move it. This is like, oh, oh my God. This is <laughs> what traditionally the mold would have looked like. Right? This is night and day difference. Right, so this is like a 44 pound mold. This is only one and a half pound. Yeah. Um, 
So this is what they would traditionally do. And this is what is enabled with that process. So now we actually can bring cheaper, faster molds um, to composite world where um, traditionally wasn't possible. Um, and stamping didn't make sense because you had to make a mold to form that part anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you, you could just see like even just the weight difference in the, the handling, you know, yes. there's like all that safety, not to mention. <laughs> yeah, and I showed you downstairs. So this is like smallest mold. I mean, this is actually like not, not, not problematic. Yeah. You know, we have customers who are making molds that are 12 foot by five foot. So when they're machining that thing, it's not only like cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to machine it and remove a lot of material, waste a lot of material, but like literally they have to move those things with cranes. Yeah. Um, and so just like how long would each of these take to make? Um, I think this one um, took machine time, probably took us five, six hours to machine it and get the right surface finish. And that part was 20 minutes, I think. Wow. Um, but yeah, but obviously you wasted also, also a lot of material uh, with the machining process that we did it um, on our end. And if you, you know, downstairs you have these parts like, you know, uh, uh, SpaceX is one of your customers yeah. and uh, the, the parts are just massive in size. So yes. if you look at just scale these two tiny pieces up to right. um, the, the, the size down there, you're talking about way more time. Yeah. So we're talking about like this is like a foot and one foot by one foot. Uh, the parts we're doing downstairs, like some of them are five foot by 12 foot. Yeah. So uh, really sometimes like, you know, uh, 10 times bigger than these parts. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, those those are gets into hundreds of thousand dollars in terms of making the mold, especially if you want to more form it out of uh, exotic material that people usually use mm -hmm. or, or mold, uh, machine it out of exotic material that people usually use. People usually use, so this is aluminum mold, but traditionally people use a material that is as a low thermal expansion coefficient mm -hmm. because when they go through the curing process, they don't want it to expand too mm -hmm. much and destroy the part. Mm -hmm. So they usually go something with um, Invar. And Invar is very expensive alloy. Is CT is almost zero. Uh, so they're machining this very expensive alloy. This is, But then we can also form that out of a sheet. So the actual um, uh, like waste that you have on this exotic alloy is also significantly reduces. And Invar, what is that exactly? So Invar is a steel alloy that yeah. has coefficient expansion coefficient of zero, almost. Meaning that you can heat that part up, it will not expand. Yeah. Right? So it's a very good fit for thermal molding. Basically, if you have any process like composite molding where you have to you know, put the material in the mold and then put it in an oven to cure it, you don't want your mold to expand yeah. and change the dimensions of the part. Um, so people a lot of times use Invar, but it's a very expensive alloy because it has some um, trace elements in it that are very hard to find. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So how long have you guys been uh, been doing this so far? Um, so we started Machina Labs in 2019. Um, we started Machina Lab in 2019. And, um, um, but you know, we started thinking about the concept um, a year prior to that. Mm. I think we put our first, we worked with some of our academic advisors in 2018 to kind of do some first proof of concepts. Um, but then we had our first cell operation in 2020. Yeah. Um, so we've been forming parts since 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then, so right now, you guys, uh, you know, still fairly early in your. Uh, entire journey so there's still definitely going to be a little bit of like a learning curve yes. and like things that you're you're still ironing out yep what are your like day-to-day -day challenges over here well it's kind of funny you start you know i'm, I'm coming from an engineering background yeah. so like you know and my hobby used to be blacksmithing and sheet shaping i used to apprentice at this sheet shaping shop in pasadena uh, in uh, pomona ah. where we were making um uh, panels for uh, um, kind of like hot rods and custom cars by hand, hammering these sheets into shape. So when I started this company, I was very excited. I was like, you know, that my hobby, finally, I can actually <laughs> work on my hobby, but like robots will do it. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but my day to day right now, you know, as, as, as the CEO is mostly fundraising and, you know, hiring the team, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're significantly growing. We're like around 40, 45 people right now. We're mm -hmm. trying to get to 140 
by the end of the year. So oh wow, that's a massive growth. Yeah. So that's definitely something that keeps it in mind. Yeah. But also like econ like economy has kind of changed a little bit, right? You know, right now we seem like you know we are in an unofficial recession. Mm -hmm. Um. And you know how would that affect in terms of like you know kind of our ability of our customers to pay? I'm not too worried about it. I think manufacturing is an area of focus, but something that I do kind of consider is like you know how much funding we're gonna we're gonna have. But I think we're in a good shape in general in that fund. But like growing the team to 140 people definitely is something that keeps me awake at night. Yeah, I mean it's it's something that's keeping you awake at night, but most people are not faced with that challenge right now. <laughs> They're yes. faced with the opposite challenge of uh, you know a lot of teams are shredding uh, or, or shedding people yeah. um, and like downsizing, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and you know and yeah, if anybody out there from you know we're hiring a lot of software engineers. Yeah. Um, from from the companies like Facebook and others who have been you know let go. I mean we are we're still hiring. Yeah. So, what's the you know what, what's the motivation behind the hiring? Why why such an aggressive goal? You know, I mean, we've seen a lot of good interest from our customers, right? Um, you know, one of our customers on Air Force, um, you know, they have there are places where there are planes that cannot fly because uh, it was made 30, 40 years ago. There's a part for it that's missing. Oh, wow. The OEM doesn't support it anymore. And they want to remanufacture these parts. And literally, the current lead time is four years. So that means that plane is going to be sitting down on the ground for four years before they can get a part for it. Yeah. So that's a huge cost to the taxpayer. Yeah. Right? So this is this is American companies we're talking about. I'm talking about United States Air Force. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, um, the being able to kind of enable um, uh, you know these type of customers that are that urgently need parts. Um, is, is key for us and the customers showed interest uh, a lot of interest in kind of getting our technology enabled that for them so we were hoping that you know we can grow the team so that we can meet the need of the, the folks that we're, we're, we're serving including the uh, United States Air Force yeah yeah that's really interesting yeah yeah so what what's uh, what's next though what are you looking for forward to in the next year yeah I think so yeah, next year is going to be significant growth in terms of people for us. So hopefully we can maintain our agile culture and, you know, um, kind of get shit done out of tune and, you know, kind of deliver what, what our customers need. Um, but, uh, you know, what I'm really excited about is kind of expanding our capability beyond shoot forming, right? Right now our cells, you know, we talked a lot about forming, but the same cell that forms these parts drops the forming end effector, picks up a trimmer and trims the part. I, I look forward to be able to do a lot of other processing, you know, hemming the sheets, bending the sheets, um, even and enter to some areas we're like discussing right now in terms of forging thicker, sh thicker plates mm. into shape. Um, really want to, you know, what excites me is like, you know, making these robotic cells a true craftsman, right? Mm. Uh, uh, work like a blacksmith, being yeah. able to do multiple processes on the sheet. Because at the end of the day, manufacturing, uh, uh, of a part involves a lot of processes. So if you only automate forming of it and improve the forming of it and don't really provide a lot of impact in the downstream processes, then um, you know we haven't really completely solved the problem. You need to be able to go from design all the way to the final part that's being used um, in, in one go, and that's our goal. Awesome. It, you can see that the idea makes sense, right? Just logically, like it makes sense. Like, oh, you would do this, like, you know, Form it, low volume, like right. it, it just makes perfect sense. But certainly, I guess one of the challenges is like you're talking about uh, these big, expensive robots that yeah. you have to buy. Um, yeah. How'd you get over that? Well, uh, really, the, the, I think when you compare the cost of the die, they're not that expensive, mm. right? Um, surprisingly, you know, the robots, robot prices have been going down over years, right? You know, right now you can buy some of the robots you see downstairs, like 100, 120K each. Mm -hmm. The cost of one die can be up to a million dollars Wow! to make it. Um, all the labor that goes into it, all the stuff. And I think that the 120K that we talk about is still a very good amount of margin for the robot manufacturers in there. Yeah. Right? As, as the volumes increases and robots have more demand, that price can go much further down. I mean, there's no reason why a robot is more expensive than a car. A car is way more complicated system yeah. than a robot. Um, it's just that there's more demand for it. So if you have, go into an economy where there that there is a lot of demand for the robots, then the cost won't go down. I mean, like I said, like fundamentally think about it in terms of physics, there's not yeah. much in these robots. I mean, if I open them up, 
cassett body, motor, which is a just a several motor, like literally, like you can go buy it from Siemens, the same motor that Kuka used, buy yeah. it from Siemens, two two thousand dollars, um, and then, and then there's a machine gearbox, like you know, so why would it need? Why does it need to be one hundred twenty k? Yeah, right. Um, so I think the, the, the when you think about it in that term, it's actually not that high, and I think that's one of the reasons we started with sheet metal because the cost of die so high. So I think it makes sense for relatively large volumes for the, the amount of robot, the amount of time, the other parts a robot can do compared to a die are very comparable. Um, in terms of, but then the nice thing about robots is... Is that number like 50K? Um, depends, right? Like some parts, it can be three, 4,000. Some parts, it can be 200,000. Yeah, the average may be somewhere around like, you know, 30, 40K. Yeah. Obviously not as good as, as good, like if you think of F-150, you make a million of it, right? Obviously, we're never going to replace that, right? Yeah. Um, but the question becomes, um, why are we making a million of an F-150, right? Most industries where fast iteration becomes became possible, then the, 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 the number of iteration went up. Instead of like instead of like making the same thing over and over mm. again. And you, you see in the software world, like, you know, and you're familiar with it, app designs come out every week. Yeah. Uh, and updates go out even daily sometimes. But in car industry, five years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, part of it is they're just like, they have really high accountability. Anything goes wrong in a car, you have a recall, and then that's just like a terrifying part for them. Yeah. But the question is also, why is that terrifying? I think if you actually go into deep, I think it is because like things like dies are so expensive that you'd be like, okay, I need to make enough of this cup this car to make break even on the cost of the factory but if the cost of the factory was lower it could easily switch yeah and also like reliability increases usually with iteration mm. it's just because it's very hard to iterate and that's why they don't want to mm. t- touch it but like if i could try something and be like oh that didn't work replace them all and yeah. i can make something in two months yeah right yeah. um i think yeah i think it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem we kind of make a million parts to make the parts cheaper not necessarily because we're making a million parts, we're going to make a million of them is good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you definitely get into that world where, like, you, if you, as you iterate, you get, like, a certain number of iterations with some of these processes where the turnaround time is like, all right, the next iteration will come in three weeks, the next iteration will yeah. come in a month. You don't want to iterate forever. You're going to lose, like, the market. You're going to yes. lose, like, you just have to send it out to, to the market, right? And then that forces you to make that trade-off where you're, you're you know something could be better. Yeah. But instead of taking that extra step to get a second iteration, yeah, you just pack it up yes. and ship it, right? Yes. It's like, uh, not ideal, you know, people will complain about it. Right. And as an engineer, it's kind of painful because yes. people complain about it and you know going into it, right. Right? it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's a really interesting like new uh, thing that comes out of this. Yeah. And it, yeah, exactly. And I think it's funny, you know, a lot of those folks, and I'm wondering how much of if a technology like these become more available and reliable, how much of the folks who are doing high volume will go to lower volumes yeah. and be like, you know what, for the sake of our customers, we're not here anymore. And I think some push is already there. I mean, like with like Tesla and Rivian, you know, we have like Honda coming to us and say, okay, you know, I have Civic, I'm making 800,000 of those a year, but like, I cannot guarantee that my next EV car will sell as much. Yeah. So am I either going to eat the cost of putting that factory together or can I make it cheap enough so I can make 5,000 of them and test it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think with that market force of Rivians and Teslas, they're like thinking about it. They'll be like, okay, we can't do it exactly the same way we did before. Yeah. Uh, Just to bring it back all the way, like what made you want to go into this industry? What, what, What made you like excited about this? What made you, you said something earlier about, uh, you know, forming cars and, uh, yeah. You know this like love of like blacksmithing and like yeah. I mean that's definitely a big part of it. You know I was always like to make things with my hand. Um, it was funny. You know, I went to this school. It was like almost a boarding school that like was a lot of emphasis on shop, right? So like we spent early, very early days since I was like in elementary school, like a lot of time in shop. You know, start with building. You know, we would cut these plates of steel to make like bottle openers and things we liked. Um, and then I did a lot of like, you know, in the summers we had to go to camp and do a lot of like, you know, carpentry and things like that. So that was just something I'm personally interested in. And then I think when I got to high school, 
it, like computers was the thing that looks like oh, oh computers are fucking fantastic like you know like I wanna I wanna I want, this seems like just you know crazy amount of creativity and innovation you can have because there's no limitation of physical yeah so you go, I went toward that right and then you know I became a computer engineer actually um, when I went to school and but then I think after school I realized like like I still want to work in physical spaces and I think kind of this is now combining both of those for me is at the personal level mm -hmm. where like you know you can bring computers and robotics have that flexibility but maybe bring it to the physical world uh, and build things and I think that is the next frontier I think you know you look at you know chat GPT and AI in the virtual world they're they're going bananas they're going yeah. through the, all those kinds of crazy things you can almost talk to a computer and it will give you all kinds of answers like a human would it's very soon that we get to a point where you can also ask computer to design things. I think there are oh, folks yeah. that are already working on that. So you can be like, oh, design me a car that looks as sporty and has this feature and that feature, and we'll design that car for you. Now, the question becomes, how do you take that out of the virtual world and manufacture it? Today, unfortunately, not everything can be manufactured because of the pro limitation of the processes. Mm -hmm. Like everything you build, everything you can imagine, like most of the things you can imagine probably can't be manufactured. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and you know it as a mechanical engineer. Yeah. There's this process that we call design for manufacturing, the DFM. Yeah. Um, and and I think so. The next frontier is like as these um, like intellect uh, virtual systems have become so complicated and so sophisticated and can do all kinds of things. How can you match that capability in the real world? And I think technologies like this is going to be that interface. Right? Yeah. Where you can be like, okay, I want to build this car, but now I I can form all the panels in that car with this process. Yeah. Right. The car that the the, the AI, the the Chat GPT that can design cars can yeah. can can that gave to me now I can make it. And these software systems, they were able to get to where they are because you could iterate. Yes. Because you could just like rapidly like test it and like you, you get faster computers, the processing time gets faster, everything got better. Yes. The mechanical world, the physical world, like still has like that challenge. Yes. Seven years it takes to iterate sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, and like so, like three D printing, that was the magic of it, right. right? When it, when it became popular, it was like, oh wow, this can finally change. But then we realized that material properties, and you know, not everything is a good fit. So um, yeah, like seeing that same concept go into different aspects yeah. of manufacturing is super interesting. Yeah. So they can do all kinds of parts, all kinds of materials. Yeah, um, and truly make it like you know. And I think at the core of it also, like that, that platform building, starting thinking about it in terms of platform, not process, right? 3D printing is a process, but what is that mm. common platform that can 3D print, but it can also form sheets, but it can also hem sheets, can also do forging in an agile way. I think that is that is what excites me the most. Right? Yeah. Um, not just trying to like shoehorn, you know, every, every, yeah. every, every part into a process. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because as an engineer, you're not taught that like, oh, this manufacturing process exists. You guys are brand new too. So obviously you don't learn that in school. Like how do you educate people who are in other industries or, you know, market it so that people are just like aware of what the uh, possibilities are? Yeah, I think it's a challenge for sure. I think, you know, it's funny, even when I started this company, I remember going to like experts in robotics and we're like, oh, it can be done. <laughs> well, what's, well, what's with the flag? It's never going to be accurate. It's too many, too high of a force. Robots are new to lead. Like, this is just not going to happen. Um, what it took was, and I decided to go to the interns that I had at previous jobs. The ones that were in school at the time and they were interning for me. And like, hey, graduating from school, you want to join this new company that we were starting? And, and then it, they had no objections to what could be and could not be done. <laughs> They were like, oh, let's get started. And I think it was an interesting thing. It was that like these, the when early, early team, they're all young, young folks from like very good schools, very creative, but like have no expectation of what can or cannot be done. Mm. And then it was done, right? And then we went back to the experts and they were like, well, look at it, it's actually forming. And now mm. like the experts are coming back to our team and they're like, okay, let's just start working with these guys. It's actually work. I think the reality is that m most of our users are going to be those people who are more positive or not more positive but more in some extent naive about what can be done and they're mm. coming and they actually start playing with this and be like and you know completely switch to this process and start using this this techniques i think they're going to be more resistance toward the folks who've been like stamping for yeah. 50 years 
because that is their world, right? Yeah. So I think to some extent, the answer to the question is like just new generation of the mm. engineers who are coming in out of the school and be like, you know what, this makes sense. Let me use it. Um, but but to that to that extent, I think also just driven by the forces of the market, right? Yeah. Like you know there are, you know, like I said, we talk with Hondas and Fords of the world, and you know they've been stamping for a long time, but now they have to compete with Rivians and Teslas and and put cars out there and test cars and mm-hmm. they are looking for technology that enables them. Um, but from our perspective, what we're trying to do is like try to just see as much as we can provide matching features to stamping so it's easy for them to kind of make that switch. Mm. But inevitably there's a lot of trade, right? You know, and I think that will be part of our company for sure. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So yeah. Well, thank, so you. thank you for your time. Great questions. This is actually good. I enjoyed talking. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs>